very good number of short words. Well, I guess you could. Some aspect. Yeah. Well, I guess you could. Some aspect. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is about 25 to 28 cents per gallon. 170 allowed that to sunset. Previously, you had to reauthorize this every three years or basically push out the sunset uh, provision. We are very much interested in getting that change. We, meaning transit systems, university bus systems, and school bus systems. For our purposes, this means about $90,000 a year in savings that would drop directly to the bottom line. You can imagine the amount of money that it means to the school system running around 400 buses uh, at a much more intense level than, than we are. Uh, and so this is going to be a concerted effort from all of those bodies to get preferably a permanent exemption from this, uh, this excise tax. If we can't get a permanent, obviously a three year will be fine and acceptable and we'll just go back in every three years uh, and have it extended. The third item on the list is legislation that the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia is working on that would take the existing t SPLOS language, which allows a county to come in and to offer a five-year referendum to the voters to fund transportation-related projects. ACCG is looking at adding a transit component to that. So a TSPLOS could be a five-year project list for non-transit and a 20-year list slash levy for transit projects. We're not sure if that would work, but it's in their hands to try to move this through and move it through legislative council, and we would be very supportive of that particular initiative because, in fact, that would sort of get us to where we want to be uh, in the big picture. The importance of the 20 years, obviously, is that five years does not do us any good in being able to leverage dollars to buy and to, to leverage federal money for long-term capital expenditures and purchases, whereas 20 years does that. And that's the magic of the 20-year figure. Commissioner Stone. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I have this Friday, Thursday and Friday, an ACCG Board of Managers meeting. And if you all would like, I'd be happy to take some resolution saying that Chatham County is in support of this. If you think that if the board so wishes to help push ACCG with this item. That'd be great. All right, move. Okay, then. We'll wait till you finish and then vote on that, what she had just brought so up. It's just a suggestion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The, the final item, and this is the big one, this is passage of a constitutional amendment to authorize what we are calling a trans-floss. Trans-floss would be a referent or it would allow a county to create a up to one cent local option sales tax for up to a 40 year period to fund all iteration of transit operation, administration, capital, and would allow non-FTA certified systems to utilize these funds as well so that you could have a small system in a smaller county that would perhaps run 10 senior citizens buses, then they could utilize this money for that, which should make it very attractive uh, to those jurisdictions. As part of this, and this is somewhat unique to Chatham County, but not necessarily. If a county collects a millage rate to fund transit operations, and keep that in mind, transit operations, if they implemented this transplos, every year they would be required to roll back that millage rate to zero. You don't want the millage rate to disappear, but if you are asking for a sales tax, you want to have something there that will pro provide property tax relief. And the transit operations part comes into play with other counties that don't necessarily have a transit millage, but use part of the millage from their general fund to fund transit operations. And this language would trigger a rollback in that amount of millage for that jurisdiction. So for every county that would decide that they were going to operate this and enact this provision, 
there would be a requirement that a portion or all of the millage devoted to transit uh, would disappear for that particular year. And this is a two-year piece of legislation. It will be introduced later in the session. We'll have to sit on the table uh, over the interim and then would be voted on by the General Assembly during the 2018 session and would be on the ballot for the voters to ratify uh, statewide at the general election in 2018. I see two questions, Commissioner. Ellen, Ellen. Well, that's right. um, Bill, I mean, Bill, Mike, you? Um, these last two, do you see a problem if we on the fourth one here, the trans loss, were to support that, that it's going to hurt our efforts for number three? Uh, I think they would probably run independently. I'm not certain that the, I'm not certain that you can actually do a bifurcated referendum that would levy one tax for five years and one tax for 20 years. So you would, you would advocate for both of these to be let together? Them, let them run on their own merits, yes. I mean, I'm just worried that it's kind of like when the school board was proposing a millage increase, but yet they wanted uh, the East Law, uh, the right. T, whatever, East the, the East education East, spa, yeah. East Law. You know, the voters, pe people called me and said, they're not going to, we don't want both. Right. One or the other. So that's why I'm asking the question here, do you see this could be one or the other? And, and if so, what would be more advantageous to us locally? And the constitutional way. amendment would be more advantageous okay. to us locally, and I think constitutional amendment will be more attractive to <coughs> counties and, and systems around the state because the way that the trends floss or the, the bifurcated ACCG language is written, mm -hmm. there is not a rollback contained in there. It does not allow for, at least in the version that I have seen, which could be changed, mm -hmm. uh, there's not language in there that would allow these funds to be used necessarily for non-FTA uh, certified systems. And so we're trying to write as much flexibility into the constitutional amendment as possible. Uh, in addition, in the Constitution, while the, while the ACCG language would call for a countywide referendum right. under the TSPLOS law, under the TRANSPLOS, there would be a double trigger. The county could decide on their own to pass a resolution to very simply put this tax into place, or the county could decide that they were going to call for a referendum to put that into place. And that is mm -hmm. something that has not been decided and would be decided when we get into the actual enabling legislation, which would be something that would be coming forward in the 2018 legislature. Well, after the last failure of the proposed T-SPLOST, you know, I'm worried that we wouldn't get both of these done. So that's just my concern. Right. And to me, this trans cost in eliminating the millage would be a huge selling point yes. to the citizens here locally because then you move more towards a consumption tax. Yes, I agree. No, you're right. And, and to put this into perspective, uh, the mill to CAT at this point in time on the special service debt <coughs> generates about $9 million a year. If we were to go with a one cent SPLOS, Mm -hmm. Trans gloss, that would be $60 million. Half cent would be $30 million, quarter cent would be $15 million. Obviously, those numbers will fluctuate over time, but there is a net plus on either one of those iterations moving forward. Obviously, the half cent would be more attractive, the one cent would be more attractive, but the way we're writing this to introduce it is to start it with the platinum standard of one cent in 40 years. Uh, with the understanding that there is going to be some modification in this legislation as we move forward. And the reason we pick the 40-year the standard is that the Fulton County voters just approved by a 75% vote to levy a additional one-half cent tax for MARTA for a period of 38 years. And the reason 38 years was out there is that coincides with the expiration of the, the original MARTA tax 
for one cent. So there's, there's, some, there's some rationale in how this has been put together and a significant amount of thought in how to position this to be successful moving forward. Plus, this is a single county effort. Obviously, there's, a, there's an opportunity to perhaps do something multi-county, but we already tried multi-county, and it did not that, work. Yes. That's, that's why I was asking. Right. That's a very good question. Uh, not my question, but I, I do agree with Ellen that, you know, how we handle rolling this out for public acceptance is going to be tricky because we're asking for two, essentially one cent additions to an already contentious sometimes sales tax, right. and uh, I think that's going to be a little complication. I mean, the, the concept of, or the information that MARTA got this approved with a 75% margin, uh, that's encouraging, but Fulton County also has a mass transit mindset that Chatham County does. Right. Right. That's going to be a complication. My question was, and I think you told me, you told us this before, but I just wanted to confirm this constitutional amendment for a transplant would allow us to use that money for something more than just capital. Yes. Right? yes. We would be able to use that as operational. The language that will be written is being written into the amendment was far more than the ballot question itself. And we are very precise in saying uh, that it is transit operations of, of all iterations, uh, capital, administrative, uh, and any other kind of transit use that we can think of that will be defined not only for those very broad categories, but then defining transit to include the wide range of transit operations and systems that exist now or could exist in the future. So there's going to be not limited to but included language in there so that if something new happens that we haven't contemplated and is another cat a category of transit, then we're covered with that because dealing with constitutional amendment, it, it's not simple. You just don't go in and amend the constitutional amendment because that language is very precise. And I think it's important that we make sure that that stays part of it because the various government entities around here have become addicted to SPLOST money yes. without ever stopping to think about the operating costs that those projects incur. Right. So, and, and I will say that this is not, the passage of this will not be a panacea because it, it does not assure that this or any other county will use this tool, but it will provide a financial tool that can be used to provide significant financial stability to transit systems around the state that are non-MARTA eligible. Okay, uh, Pete, can I just ask one question? So, so under the constitutional amendment, if you do utilize the, the transplant funds, you're basically stopped from levying any kind of millage with to support <coughs> transit activities. Uh, you would be, yes. Yes, and that would be the trade-off. Uh -huh. Because if you, if you have a millage that supports that, a property tax that mm -hmm. supports that, mm -hmm. then part of the language in here requires that that be rolled well, back. It, it, does not, it does not eliminate very cautious about leaving that tool at the end of 20 years if this expired and were not renewed, then you would have to implement a new property tax. So that property tax would, would remain, but it would be required to be zeroed out every year, much like the lost language is now, where the law for that requires that that, be, that amount of millage be rolled back every year. So we would basically changing our funding model yes. from, from property taxes to sales taxes. That is correct. And one, one other item I forgot to, to mention, there is an existing cap on the total amount of sales tax that can be levied by a jurisdiction. t -SPLOS, regional t -SPLOS is exempt from that. Language will be contained in this so that trans -SPLOS will be exempt from that cap as well. Uh, with your, uh, you know, you're up there where all of this is going on with the, uh, you know, the committees, the legislation, and all of that. How do you feel about either one of those, uh, you know, that looks uh, very 
uh, positive that might be getting uh, the uh, best chance of passing? I think the first one is highly likely to pass because the tax is not being collected now. It's language that's on the books that needs to be taken off. The second one is costing public systems a significant amount of money. Uh, it, it, particularly for transit, it is taking money out of transit systems and then the feds are basically having to replace that money uh, that's going back into the highway fund, which is not the way the funding is supposed to work. I think the constitutional amendment is going to be very attractive. The mindset of the state leadership is that, you know, transit is beginning to make sense. And a lot of this, as uh, Alderman Durrance stated, a lot of this is being driven by what's happening in Metro. And we're hearing now positive conversations from Gwinnett, positive conversations from Cobb, and those other counties within the, the Metro Donut about how can we get involved in this either as part of MARTA or how can we do something on our own and interconnect with MARTA. Again, we don't have that tool, but as you go outside of the MARTA counties, there is a desire to figure out how to fund this, and they don't have the kind of constitutional exemption from the uniformity clause that the five or six MARTA counties have. And that's why we're having to go with the constitutional amendment to do this. So this can benefit those non-MARTA counties, those, those counties that are eligible for MARTA, but have yet to pull the trigger as Clayton did last year. Mm -hmm. All right, any comments uh, from the board members? Which one uh, would you feel? Any comments on that, what he's talking about, the constitutional, and, uh, you know, we've heard uh, about both of the provisions now. Anybody? Well, we'd like to entertain a motion and move that we approve this agenda. Second. Um, Mike, I would have to lean on you then in this board of whether we would want to take a position on either one of these, um, and if so, which one. And I don't want to take, a, I may have jumped the gun, a, a, anything to ACCG if we have a better chance with the trans and it might be better for us. So Here's what I would suggest. Right, uh, since we're, we're not saying that we're going to be really pushing for what ACCG has, Mm -hmm. and are not confident that they're actually going to be able to pull this particular piece of legislation mm -hmm. together. I would suggest that we leave it with support, the ACCG initiative, okay. and then if that starts to move, then we can figure out at what level we're going to be engaged. Uh, if it does not materialize, then uh, it becomes a moot point. And then we can bring that back to you. Obviously, this is a snapshot of what we want to see coming up during the legislation, and we've taken efforts to get bill sponsors uh, to do this. In fact, I will be in Atlanta tomorrow morning talking with the chairman of the House Transportation Committee. Uh, Ron Stevens has agreed to be co-sponsor on these bills. I'm going to be meeting with the chairman of the House Transportation Committee to talk about being the lead sponsor on this constitutional amendment legislation. So as we go through, there are going to be other bills that are going to present themselves that we'll have adequate opportunity to look at and make a decision on are we for or against okay. that makes sense. What we don't want to do is sacrifice the trans for the T-Sports. That is very true. Very true. Okay, we have a motion. Oh, no, go ahead. No, that is exactly what I was going to suggest to make sure that we have adequate time you yeah. know, uh, to, to prepare ourselves to go which the way we would like to go. <coughs> I will make sure that that's so. It makes better Perfect. sense to me. Yes. We have a motion on the floor to approve the agenda, and we need a second. I second it. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Now for the other. Resolution? Do we do the resolution now? No. Um, okay. All right. Next um, 
is the uh, DPIM procurement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff request for approval to purchase one Allison transmission dual power inverter module or DPIM uh, for a uh, unit uh, level of three in the amount of $48,261. Uh, CAT has a fleet of 25 hybrid buses. This is the second deep end failure that we've experienced. Uh, the first occurred uh, October of 2014. And there's no warranty. Uh, How long have we had these buses? This is uh, 2011. They're actually 2010, but we got them in 11. And all the studies, these things are going to be going out between five and seven years. They will never so this is normal. Can I make a motion for approval? Second. Have a motion on the floor for the approval of this procurement. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Item three, uh, ITS monitor purchase. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate request board approved two uh, touchscreen monitors for the two trolley buses we just got in. Um, this is part of the SAMI trolley purchase um, and it's paid for through CATS FY 2012's new repair grant with a local match from SAMI. The total cost is $24,560, which includes installation, configuration, and testing. Um, and again, like I said, the local match will be provided by the SAMI. Sure. <coughs> yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think I have some concerns, but maybe they're misplaced on this. Uh, this indicates proprietary software for the system, and as I understand it, we have limited access to data that Endura is collecting on these systems using their proprietary software. And my question is, why do we go into what's essentially a new operation with the shuttle system with these shuttle with these trolleys and continue committing ourselves to that limited access to the data that, that we're paying for? I mean, is there no other option than to continue with the Endura system? Um, at some point there could be, but... but In draw, I'm sorry. Right, but the point is, is that um, we don't have another at CAD ABL system at CAD. We don't have another one. So we, to purchase a new CAD ABL system, it, it's millions of dollars. So we either have no CAD ABL for the trolleys or we have the interest system for the trolleys. Um, like I said, at some point, we could look at grant funding and, and go to a new direction for ITS because times have changed and, and there's been technology improvements, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for now, we either have to go with the intra monitors and the system that we already currently have, or we have to have no CAD ABL in there, well, or buy a new CAD ABL system. What would happen if we didn't have the system in there now? We wouldn't be able to track the vehicles. Um, we wouldn't be able to get maintenance updates, which is an automatic feed from the, from the buses to the maintenance department. Um, we wouldn't be able to uh, on-time performance. I mean, there's a litany of things that we wouldn't be able to do. There's, there's a litany of things that concern me about continuing to be operating within this corner that we're backed into uh, as well. I mean, if we have no choice, I suppose we have no choice, but how long are we committed to this this system with intro? When do we get out from under we, this? We, we can certainly do our research and we'll let the board know. Uh, Timetable. I didn't mean this particular purchase item. How long are we stuck with the interest? The interest. Five to seven years. It was paid 80% with FTA grant funds, and the useful life was five to seven years. And where are we in that five to seven years now? Four, Four years in. 2018 will be the fifth year. So next year we could be looking to move on. Yes, sir. I'd really like to start seeing information on that because it really bothers me that we're paying for stuff that we can't even get access to data. It bothers me that we continue moving in that direction with this kind of purchase, especially on something that, that for the city of Savannah, we hope to revolutionize parking and transportation issues downtown. Uh, and, and I, I could 
fuss on about this for a while, but this, these trolleys and, and that, that uh, downtown shuttle system is going to be key to solving a lot of the transportation issues downtown. And I, I really want to make sure we've got maximum flexibility with this system. Okay, okay then. Any other comments on this? Uh, all right, then. Uh, we need a motion on the floor. So moved. Second. All in favor for this uh, monitor's purchase, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carries. Item four, the OMD task change order. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Staff request board approve the change in cost to task order 2017-1 to RSNH to complete an origin destination transportation <coughs> study. Um, the purpose of this is because uh, the MPO currently has to gain data as well, and so they wanted to partner with us to split the cost of the actual um, the actual time frame of gathering this data. So we first went into the same, we were going to get one month worth of data, and since they need additional data um, to purchase an additional month, we, they would split the cost of the two months with us, and it would actually expand the area of data as well as the two months instead of one month. Um, so the increased cost of that would be 50 or, I'm sorry, we, we're at, it's the increased cost is 20000 but we're going to be splitting the two months equally, so it'll be $26,314 per organization, um, which is actually better than we were paying just for the one month that we actually get more data. Is there any possibility that this backfires on us and winds up costing us more money? Uh, how, how solid is this? shaking kid back there. Are you comfortable that we're not going <coughs> to? Yeah, we, we're just going to order the one month for now. Um, and then once we have our uh, MOU in place with um, the core MPO, then we can order that additional month, mm -hmm. um, which saves us essentially from any backfire here. And, and we've met with MPO, and it's also on their agenda to approve this cost. So, so bottom line, if we approve this, we're going to be getting <coughs> two months of data, and we're going to end up paying less than we were going to pay for the one month of data. Correct. And it's a wider area. It's not just this area. It's, it's, it includes other counties. Oh, you, you, you mean, mean, you mean oh, geographically? So yes, a geographically wider area. Wider area. Okay. So and, and two months. Okay. And what other counties? Uh, we believe it was Bryan as the Richmond Hill area. Yeah. Okay. The core needed... Uh, I, I just want to ask this again to make sure that this won't slow our study down. Because this ridership study is key to our reorganization of the routes, which is really important to our increasing our ridership. So this won't, there's no way this will slow us down. We're moving forward with our, our plans, and then we'll be adding them on. So we're not, we're not doing, we're not going to stand by and wait. Question to segue into mine, which is if we're already doing ours, what benefit is, is another study on top of what we're doing? It's, it's, it's just expanding the geographic area of the study and it also provides an additional month. So we can stay with the track where we are and get our, our area with one month. And then if we, but if we add them, we get a wider area and an additional month. So it's just more data for us that we can do to have well, a better study. I understand, but I mean, we've got. We need to complete our study and find out what we need to be doing here locally to increase our ridership and look at our routes. And I'm, my concern is, is a little bit like Mr. French's, is you know, I don't want to dilute that. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure, especially with the ridership reports that we've gotten, and I realize the hurricane had an effect, but we're damned. And I want to find out why. Is it the routes? Is it the mindset? Is it the price of gas? What is it? Yeah. Uh, when will the study complete? Uh, late spring. Late spring? This next spring, yes. It means March, April? Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's going to be a presentation. We're going to have a presentation. Oh, we don't want to kill the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other? Questions, uh, comments? 
need a motion on the floor for the, uh, uh, the task change order. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor and a second for that task change order. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Item five, <coughs> the MOU between CAT and CORE MPO. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this kind of go coincides with the previous action item and get the board to approve the MOU between uh, MPO and us to do what we just talked about is a draft MOU on the next page of, uh, after the action item page. Um, and obviously any MOU will be not binding until we have legal approval. <coughs> okay. so, mm -hmm. uh, Wayne? So if there's any changes, it'll come back to the board? If the legal folks have any issues with it, it'll come back to the board? Uh, it certainly can. Um, basically, what you have in front of you is the is a template of what we would use. If there's any drastic changes with monetary or with CAD in general, any kind of liabilities or anything like that, we would certainly do that. Did you, did you I, I would suggest that be approved subject to legal review for, for any kind of minor conforming edits or things like that, but anything substantive um, that would obviously interest the board could, could come back, but if it's if it's just drafting um, um, things like that, I, I think we would sort of use our discretion in terms of recommending execution. Um, well, we'll talk things, back to the board. I think the two things that we've identified is substantial enough that we want to hear about is if it ca creates any delay in, in our work and if it creates any change in funding right. other than what's been presented. We want to see those back. Yes, sir. Okay. The, the little minor problems we had with it, we already cleared that up. Sorry. We had some little minor problems. Six, Title Six Plan. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
FQS board approved the Chatham Area Transit Authority Title VI plan as revised. Uh, the FTA requires the board of directors to approve the Title VI plan. Um, every three, each three-year period, CAT submits an updated plan to the FTA. Um, our current plan was set to expire November 30th, 2016, um, and we have updated it and sent it off to uh, FTA in 2015. And they're currently, it's currently under review, and final approval will be given by the FTA, but it has to be after board, the board approves the revised plan. On, yeah, on page 9, um, and that might actually not be the right page, but one of the things I noticed in reading through some of this is the restrictions that it places on us on being able to change uh, routes in some cases because of serving certain populations. Uh, how much this is not that we have much choice, I suspect, but how much does this impact what we want to do with changing based on our ridership studies? Like how are we going to wind up in court cases about being able to change our routes? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think we would do something that would require us to go to court, um, but we, we have public meetings. We have to certainly do a Title VI analysis to make sure that the routes that we do change uh, still comply with the law. Well, I guess that's more my question, not about the court case so much, but, you know, in our goal to try to create a, a more effective route system, are we going to be hamstrung by something like this? Again, not that we have much choice about doing this, but um, right. is that going to create routing problems? It's, it's hard to say right now because we haven't analyzed it. We haven't looked at what changes would be necessary, but that the point of view of the Title VI analysis would allow us to see what impacts it does have, and then we can make decisions at that point. But I don't want to speculate how much it would constrict us right now. Wayne and So I, I think from the past, whenever we wanted to do minor changes, minor alterations, that would trigger the public hearing. No, public 20, you have to change 25% of, right. of a route or eliminating an entire route. Um, or creating a new route. Those trigger public meetings and there's a backwards calendar you have to do a certain amount of time frame when you do the meetings before you do the changes. Right. So, uh, I mean, it would restrict this in the sense that maybe we would have to go through an additional process that might delay, you know, uh, implementing something new, but it doesn't preclude our being able to do that. I mean, if I'm understanding this right. To some extent it does. I mean, we can't shift all of our routes to areas that we in, in, in totally not serve a certain segment of the population. We, we can't necessarily do that. Um, well, it has to be equitable, and th that's why the analysis is required, and we have public hearings and all that. But to, to answer your question, we can change routes, yes. Right. But we, we want to make sure that it doesn't have a disproportionate impact on any particular population right. whenever we do so. And right. it gives a chance to the public to have input into yes. the process. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's just designed to keep us honest, is that Well, yeah, the FTA requires <laughs> us to, to make sure that we're in concert with the public when we do major changes that's going to right. maybe impact them. Um, and so to allow that, have that opportunity for them to go to the public meeting and voice their concerns. And for us to do the analysis right. so that we could show that we did our due diligence right. when we went through it. And, and I would assume that any plan that we submitted to the FTA would require some sort of equity analysis and that kind of thing. Absolutely. In order for FTA to approve. Right. And, and does this have, it, just to sort of move to something else, would, would this have an impact on, you know, the announcements as to major intersections or major stops that are being approached in terms of um, using languages other than English in our announcements? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think it would have to do with that. Well, I notice there's a, a lot of reference to limited income proficiency. Yes, there is. So I'm curious as to whether that's been thought about in the context of this plan. I mean, it's not some, you know, it doesn't hobble us you right. know, in terms of the consideration today, but, but that came to mind when I was reading through this. Because I don't think we do announce any stops in any language other than English. So, right, yes, that's correct. so it might be something that we can look at. Sure. Um, Helen and then Bill. Um, just real quickly, reading through, I, I, the, I guess financial um, 
requirements for a lot of this language stuff concerns me is do we receive any grant money for any of that? I mean, is there anything available to help offset some of these requirements? No. Just, just our general 5307 grant that you get. I mean, I understand, but it was just, it was rather massive. You just don't get the grant money if you... But I mean, it was rather massive what the requirements were, especially language barriers. Also, just one grammatical error on page 7 when it says the cat stabbed Pam instead of Cass. I get that confused. Page what? 7? Page 7. Midway down. Midway down it says cat stabbed Pam. It is identified instead of Cass identified. I just don't want us to... To be confusing. Are singulars a pure plural? Exactly. I'm with you. English majors are silent majors. You know, it's just, I think if we have a document, it should be written properly. I absolutely agree. My question, I fully anticipate at the end of our ridership study and adjusting routes, we are going to be beyond that 25% point. And I could be wrong, but based on what we've seen with these ridership studies, I think we're going to see something more than a 25% change in routes. So how much time, once we decide we want to change this stuff, because we're talking about having this data in late spring, how long is it going to take us to go through all of these hearings and things? How much time is that going to add before we actually get to go to a new routing system? The timeline is going to be tight. I mean, once the origin destination study is complete, we're thinking at the end of April probably for that. We probably need two to three months to go through all the public hearings and solicit input. So, I mean, I think the original idea was to have the changes go into effect in July, but we're going to be cutting it real close. So if not July, we have to look at whether we want to do that in November or after July. Or after, yeah. And have we been doing the LEP, you know, when this situation has come in the past? And so we have a positive situation then with the LEP. I understand the particular issue. Yes, sir. Okay. Part of my frustration is with the fact that we apparently are going to have to look at another nine to ten months of these numbers before we can do anything. The LEP provisions in here seem like they're rather onerous. The requirements seem rather onerous. But with technology as it is today, I think it's becoming less onerous as time goes on. Well, you're right, but it's just that it's massive. I mean, when I was reading through this, I had no idea of some of the federal requirements. And it's one of many components that is a requirement to receive the federal funds. So we have staff resources dedicated to that type of compliance year-round. And the second thing is that the goal, I guess, is to have it go into effect for the next budget year. So we'll be able to implement it if everything falls into place. Okay. We need a motion on the floor for item six. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor signify saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Plans approved. Item seven, the accounting policy and procedures manual revision. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This next question for the approved revision is the accounting policy and procedures manual. We need to update it to appropriate changes from the FTA. And we have done so. And that policy is attached. Can I make a request that when we're going to have large documents like this with revisions to them, that we can see a red line version? Yes, sir. Not for this. But going forward, I'd like to see a red line version. Yes, sir. The control log is how we've done that in the past. But we can change that. The 
one page summary that indicates what was deleted and what was added is after the board report and we use that as opposed to a red line version that we can add back. So basically all we've done to change the policy is add a paragraph that further explains our echoes raw process. Yes, that's the only thing that was changed. We added that paragraph and it was at the FTA request that we indicate exactly what we do to prepare the documentation for our grant process. What is our time frame? Are we under some type of time crunch to be able to approve this today? Yes, sir. The FTA recommended these changes and we need to make the changes before our January 2nd submission on their review. I mean, I guess the only thing I was thinking about is it's a rather voluminous document and we've gone through a lot of lessons learned over the past year. Yes, sir. The document hasn't been changed since the last time we approved it. The only thing we've done is add that paragraph. So you've approved the document before? We're just adding this paragraph on the last page? Yeah, I know that. There were a couple of items, though, such as billing, such as inventory. There were several items in there that I don't know whether they need to be strengthened up to address maybe some of the issues that we've been dealing with. We can do that. We can certainly do that and bring it back to the board. We would need this to comply with FTA, but we can revise it and strengthen it up and come back and approve another revision, certainly. I don't want to hold it up. I was just wondering what the time crunch was in order to do that. For this particular edition, we need it for the review submission, but we can surely take an overall look at the policy and suggest any revisions to strengthen any area of concern you may have, and we can bring that back to you at any time. It doesn't have to be an annual review. It can be revised. I'll move for approval. Second. I have a motion on the floor and a second for the county policy and procedures manual revision. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Item 8, procurement policy and procedures manual revision. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Staff request board approve the revisions of the county's procurement policy and procedures manual, which is necessary to incorporate a checklist now due to FTA recommendations, and that's what we've done, and I believe it's, yes, after this page you will see exactly what we're looking at as far as the checklist that we have to start incorporating. There was no checklist prior? We used a control log that was more like a table of contents, and they just wanted us to change the format. To a checklist. Just a format. To a checklist, yep. So we have to send this back to them, approved by the board by the end of the year, to show we've done that. So we've got a couple weeks. Well, this is the last board meeting of the year. Second. Motion on the floor and a second for the procurement policy and procedures manual revision. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Item, main item for presentations, the O&D study kickoff. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be over to the chair to do a presentation. It's all queued up, I believe. Yeah, I can get it. I can get it. Just let me know. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, board. My name is Rachel Hatcher. I'm with RSMH. We have Beverly Davis here as well for the tough questions. Point them that way. Yeah. But we're here today for the kickoff of the O&D study, and y'all hit a lot of really great questions up front, so this is all going to fit right in. If you would go ahead and hit the next one. So the presentation agenda today, we're going to give you a brief introduction as well as a discussion on the project goals. We'll talk about the project elements that will help us to meet those goals as well as the very brief schedule. 
um, activities to date and next steps to get there. Um, and you can see in the uh, graphic on the right, that's your study area, so all of Chatham County, and this was prior to your agreement that you uh, went into today. Um, so we will be expanding that for Richmond Hill, which you'll see in a couple of uh, slides yet. Next slide. Um, so the introduction and project goals, this is an origin and destination analysis. You'll see that uh, abbreviated to O and D analysis very frequently in transit planning. Um, so we're here to identify travel patterns using AirSage data, and these graphics on the bottom of the screen are um, provided by AirSage and representative of what they collect. So mobile phone device data. There are two primary carriers, um, and when the cell phone interacts with the towers, it captures that data. That data is collected by these cell phone companies, and then in partnership with AirSage, they anomalize the data, so they're not selling who the information belongs to or where precisely they're living, but rather aggregated so that we can see their general movements. So you can see the bubble there represents the aggregated anomalized data, and if you see the map on the right-hand side, you see geographically how that's dispersed. So you don't know the precise address, but rather an aggregate of information in the general area. Um, and there's Forsyth Park in the middle for reference. You can see quite a bit of activity going on in the downtown area. It's important to also note that that minimum size there is about 300 meters across, that you don't get any more granular than that. So we're looking at blocks of information rather than precise pinpoints of origin and destination. What, and what, yes. what, what do the dots mean? you got gold dots and green dots? The dots are people that are living there or people that are visiting that zone and living in another zone. So you can tell if folks are, that's their point of origin or their point of destination. So you can tell by looking at the map in one point. Also, you have the little blue ones, and those are people that are on the move. So they're not living there, they're not working there or stopping there. They're just moving through. So you can see little captures of information of the general uh, data you would collect. And if you would hit it again, you're going to see a transition to what, a different slide. What, what, do, you, do you not collect information for people who have no phone? You do not. So this is a sample that is then um, okay. used as a trajectory. Uh, to the population. So generally speaking, you're talking about um, you know, the largest majority of the population utilizing a cell phone, and then they take your whole population and use that as your trajectory. So you, you're using it as a very large sample um, and then normalizing it to your population. But, but it, it, is that always done? I mean, it would seem to me that, you, you know, if you just sort of base your findings on phone users versus non-phone users, can you necessarily extrapolate that everyone We have uses quality control procedures in place where we look at your underlying socioeconomic data gathered okay. by the U.S. Census. We look at your transit ridership numbers, and we have the MPO uh, data that they use for their travel demand model to also look at all of the world of information. So this is a very important tool for this study, but it's mm -hmm. not the only one. Okay. We don't use it as a silver bullet. Um, so then you can see in the graphic it has changed to look at the larger study area. So the more you zoom out, um, the more those numbers are aggregated geographically. And if you hit it one more time for me, Terry. And this is what we do with it. We take that information and we say, okay, here's the world of origin points and here's the world of destination points in your study area. Where are the most frequent origin to destination correlations? Where are people trying to get most frequently? And then you see your road network lying underneath and your transit system network lying underneath and you say, are we putting the right transit routes in the right spot? Um, and so those are what the remainder of the bullets on the screen refer to, determining areas that are currently under or overserved by Chatham Area Transit. Are those leader lines, places where folks are trying to go and return to in the right areas um, in correlation with the transit routes, identifying opportunities for additional service areas. So there may be opportunities within the study area that we don't even have service yet, whether that be for transit dependent populations or choice ridership population. So looking at all of that data and saying, where are our greatest opportunities for increasing our ridership? These and lines are created then by, by knowing where a phone starts and where it stops. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And you have and you have pings along the way when it's in when it's in motion. So you can see where they're where they're going. Um, and then the last recommendations to enhance operational efficiency and potential expansion. So we're also going to be looking at you know, ways to modify your existing routes. If there is ridership, if there is need there, how can we maximize that benefit? Next slide, please. Um, so this is your study area, and it's a little, it's a little uh, blurred there, but that is the traffic analysis zone structure we'll be looking at, and um, Richmond Hill is incorporated in, into that data set. Um, so we've been coordinating with AirSage for the data purchase. Um, the other project elements, data review and analysis, when we get it, it'll be in a raw format. We'll have to process that data, start creating those origin destinations um, and, in order to get some findings out of them. 
Um, we'll perform the transit suitability analysis and, of course, recommendations in the final report, which you'll see come April. Yes, sir. Can you go back one slide just to make sure we understand this? Sure. So what you're saying then is this particular dot is somebody either living there or going there. Correct. And just by miraculous association, he would be on the transit line, or this is what the transit line should be? There's, there is not a direct correlation between air stage data and the transit route. So you have to pull that data with ridership numbers and do a, compa a direct comparison. So there's no way to determine that that mobile user is on a transit system. Okay, but your, so your software is making that line. Correct. Saying in this particular case, this is where we should be. Correct, going. correct. So we'll have points of origin, which is a single point, points of destination, and then making those connections. Um, and next, I think we're good with this slide. Next slide, please. So this is your overall schedule. Um, we're about midway through the December point. You can see across the top, we're meeting very regularly with your staff um, to make sure that we keep on track for the final April deliverable. Um, and so uh, the December, January timeframe is really where the rubber meets the road. We're going to be hitting the ground running once we get the data in-house um, and building it in a way so that when the second month comes online, it's really an add-on to what we've already built. So the framework will be there and we can move very rapidly through the uh, April timeline. And we plan to be before you uh, two more times before the end of the study. So you'll have a midpoint presentation to show your progress um, and seek feedback and then a final presentation from April. And what is transit suitability analysis? What does that mean? That's really um, boiled down one liner to say, are, you, are your routes in the right place or aren't they in comparison uh -huh. okay. to all of the given data? So really analyzing how this data um, should inform the changes that you would like to make moving forward. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, so activities to date, the first two months we've done a lot of coordination. We've worked directly with your CAT staff to determine the appropriate traffic analysis zones to purchase, um, how to aggregate those to get the best analysis for your dollars. Um, we've worked directly with AirSage to make sure that we're keeping within their standard parameters. Um, developing the transit propensity analysis, we've already done that and that's based on eight demographic factors that is collected from census data as well as um, the American Community Survey data to say who is most likely in your community today to ride transit. So that we have a lot of those already ready to go once we get this origin and destination data to overlay. Um, we reviewed your, your task structure, which you saw on the previous uh, map, so that has been complete and ready to transmit to AirSage. Um, coordinated the data purchase and ongoing coordination with CAT staff, which you saw is happening approximately every two weeks. Next slide. And then our next steps. Um, so of course, data purchase, we have a phone call scheduled for this afternoon to initiate that purchase. Um, it takes about a week to get the data in house and we should have it before Christmas, fingers crossed. Um, develop the OND analysis matrix. So where are people beginning and where are they ending? And you can see in the bottom uh, graphic, that's a typical um, data set that comes in from AirSage. So you take that raw data um, and you utilize the information to create your OND analysis matrix. And then from there, you model it. Um, so we'll review the data and identify the travel patterns, but we'll also be comparing that to all of the other data sets that I discussed to make sure that any anomalies are identified and addressed. So we all know that census data is not perfect. Your origin and destination data will not be perfect. So we'll look for those anomalies and make sure that they make sense, make sure that they are real, or flag them and say there are anomalies here. We need to make sure that we're double checking our data. Um, and so you'll start to see things like heat maps that you see in the top right corner, um, where you see transit activity, you see things going on, you have to make those um, appropriate correlations in the model, and then we'll start to be able to roll out those recommendations from that type of data. Next slide. And then the final slide, next steps continued. We've got, um, we will be comparing the travel patterns to the transit propensity analysis, and you can see a very gray version of that <laughs> on the slide here. Um, but really the goal for a transit propensity analysis is to find the darkest points. Um, the darker that saturation, the more uh, likely the population is to ride statistically. Um, so you would want to be identifying the best service, the greatest service for areas where you have the greatest density, the folks that are most likely to ride it. Um, and then review current service with travel patterns and propensity analysis results and develop the recommendations for service efficiencies in those possible extension or contraction areas. Um, next slide. That's all. Any questions? I know that's a lot of information very rapidly. <coughs> well, two, um, two things. So will you be, will we be able to use this data to assist us in the time six analysis? 
that we were talking about. We'll already have the census data pulled in, so okay. yes, absolutely. We'll be right. looking. We'll already be looking at those populations because you know there are two camps to ridership potential. You have your transit dependent populations, which is heavily Title VI based, and then you have your um, choice ridership platform where they don't meet those typical criteria for your Title VI okay. plan. So yes. And, and, and while I'm confident neither of you have any personal knowledge of this, but how was this done before you had cell phones? And the O&D matrix was more manual based on ridership okay. counts, typically. So okay. you can take your... He rode the bus. He rode the bus and checked. Is that what you did? Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, on and off checking, which is still important. Yeah. But, you know, we're going big data, so we can double check all of that now. So, okay. so would this go faster if we gave you grant nights, weekends, and holidays? <laughs> sure. <No. laughs> Grant, it, Grant has been working with us on a daily basis. He went to GTA last week, and we had about an hour aside discussing this study. So we, we've already captured a lot of his time. It's been very helpful. Well, I think this could be really exciting, and I think we're going to be really surprised at what we get back. And I, I agree with Bill. This is going to uh, mm -hmm. indicate some real changes in these routes. Uh, yeah, good. because the way it's been done, we don't have the real evidence about, uh, you know, what this uh, program is going to bring out to tell us about our system. Well, I think we've had major demographic shifts around the county mm -hmm. since the sure. droughts that we've got now mm -hmm. were, were put in place, too. Yeah. Right. Any other comments? Thank you all so much. Okay. Good job. But now if we don't turn our cell phones on, we can screw them up. Okay, <laughs> so we need a motion on the floor on the policy and procedures. No, no, we did that. Have we already done that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the okay, director's report. Excuse me. Okay, the next is executive director's report.
ridership before we get there. But I, I think that the hurricane is probably a comment first. I think it's probably affecting ridership more than just the days you were closed. Because I know in my personal case, the doctors were canceling appointments seven days out. So I think that it probably is greater than you think. Putting that aside, can you tell us, Curtis, we do what we do to our ridership in town. What is it nationally or regionally? Can you give us some yes, indication sir. of where we stand? Actually, yes, yeah, sir. I had great research that. Do um, you have the numbers? Yeah. Um, so I, I looked at our, uh, at the National Transit Database. Um, the last, uh, or the most up-to-date data that they had is unfortunately 2014. Um, and I looked at our passengers per hour com uh, compared to about 15 other agencies of our size. Um, and we're just below the 50% mark. Um, There's some agencies that are much higher. Um, just looking at one of them, Greensboro, North Carolina, for example. Um, in 2014, they reported 27.8 passengers per hour um, across their service, which is really good. Um, on the other end, Birmingham, Alabama, which is another similar uh, size uh, system to ours, they reported 14.3 passengers per hour for their system. Uh, so we came in, just to give you an idea of where we were, in 2014, we were 19.5. In 2015, we spiked to 20.3, so we went up. And then in uh, 2016, uh, we closed with 19.3. So when you look at it nationwide, um, it's actually interesting. We, uh, our ridership productivity went up uh, significantly from 2014 to 2015. Nationwide, it went down. And it went, went down pretty significantly. Uh, APTA uh, estimated about a 6% decrease in transit ridership productivity um, between those two years. And then from 15 to 16, um, APTA was, uh, was seeing about a 3% decline. Um, so our trends are a little bit different. We had uh, about 19.3 again in, uh, or excuse me, 19.5, then 20.3, and now we're back to about the same level as it is 2014. Um, so, you know, it all depends locally what's happening. Um, um, but, but yeah, I'd be more than happy to to share the actual figures that I pulled with any of you after this. How would that statement that you made about like doctor's appointments and all, because you had a lot of things that come in there where that, uh, it ran behind on those several days, you know, because we started looking at the, uh, the communication section over at the annex where we were uh, tracing all of the things with the uh, hurricane like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then a little on Monday. But that situation is, I mean, it has a much greater things than just, like you said, the doctors and the other things that you stated too on that. Any other questions on this? Okay, this is the unit updates information only. Um, I guess we can start, Mr. Chair. Excuse me. I think the legislative stuff is next. It's part of the it's part of the report. So yes, I had a question there. Um, in the report from Square Pet and Boggs, the uh, debrief about the sandbox program that we didn't get funding from um, indicates that. Um, we didn't explain with enough detail how the project would increase equity and accessibility for, big, for individuals with vision, hearing, and mobility disabilities. Seems like that's something that we would have been very sensitive to. Is there, I mean, should we have been better prepared for that? Should Squire Patton Boggs have prepared us better for that, or is, is, is this just okay? The way um, it was explained to us, FTA said we had a great application. Um, but they didn't give us money. It got down to the fact that this mobility sandbox program is was only eight million dollars for the entire country, and I asked them, "Is there just a coincidence that the money you gave out among the eight million only went to large systems? So there were no small systems that got anything. It's all L.A., San Francisco, Chicago. Uh, only large systems got part of the eight million. Um, they said there was no coincidence." 
to be that way. Um, but they said that every application was really good. Ours was great. They also commended us. They knew we were we were very uh, diligent about this because we submitted our application before anybody else. Um, so they were very complimentary. However, they had to get down and nitpick little things. They said to in order to determine who would get it. And the one nitpick thing they found on that ours was we could have enhanced more about the low vision and hearing. How had that had how that would interact with our app and, and our, our new technology. We were going to partner with the Brow Match. Um, that was the thing they found that, that separated us from the web. Um, <coughs> so the debrief was good, um, and we also debriefed with Squire Patent and Box, and we have some ideas on uh, the next round of funding. Um, one of the things that is the question is, is do we go after this again, or will we do something different? You know, they see the same type of application, but just improved of that area, it may not may not win because there's new ideas out there next year, new, new things. We have to we have to figure out if we're going to go for something different or if we're going to just tighten up what we have and try again. Um, but again, it's a it's a very low funded grant uh, opportunity. It's basically the FTA is trying something new where you can partner with a private company prior to the grant award um, and they. They wanted to see what people's ideas were and how it would affect the regulations and if they would need to bypass a regulation here or there to get new technology and creative ways to deal with um, transit. And so it's just kind of an experimental type thing. That's why there's only a million available for the whole country. Um, but you know, we'll keep submitting. We'll submit again next year and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay, and our application this year was to fund uh, the uh, app. Yes, yeah, so you want to go ahead and explain in detail, uh, Grant, since you wrote the uh, portion of that. Yeah, so the application was more or less built around a mobile payment um, solution. Um, when individuals downloaded the app, um, they were then granted access to um, use a bunch of different user benefits. One of them was a rewards program, um, which we put in there. Um, we probably could have gone into a little bit more detail on that. So I think that's one area where we definitely could improve. Um, and then there was also um, some information built in th into that, which would uh, link to various um, uh, modal options, connecting with Uber, connecting with the bike share program, connecting with parking downtown. Um, and then there was also uh, an element in there of like tracking um, how, how many calories you've burned uh, and things of that nature. Um, I think really where where we got hit the hardest, and, and this was mentioned earlier, was the fact that we didn't provide enough detail on how would it help individuals that don't have a smartphone um, and individuals with disabilities. Um, and they told us if we can clean that up a little bit, and if there is another um, um, opportunity uh, for this program, uh, that we'd have a good chance to clean that up. Did that app also include service delivery? Noise with the bus is coming and oh, yeah. improving. So yeah. where are we on that? Really? Well, we, that, that was the understanding <coughs> that we would be connecting to whatever CAD AVL system we have currently. And we would be using that data. Um, but there's a time frame. You know, by the time the money would come in, we'd probably be looking at either sticking with Inja or looking at another option anyway. Um, but real-time data is critical to any sort of uh, mobile app. So that's something we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have to face. So we still have no in the foreseeable future no real time app for knowing when the bus is gonna come to a stop. That's not true. Um, the app actually is finished, but we're looking at uh, whether or not we need a, another circuit because when everybody starts logging onto the app, it could overload our current circuits. So we're doing testing right now, um, and it's we're also testing it within staff. So iPhone testing as well as Android testing it. Um, so we're in the testing phase right now. So very soon we're going to do either a soft launch or hard launch, depending on how comfortable we want it out in the market and test it. But um, the app itself is, is pretty much done. Okay. 
you're just uncomfortable releasing it until. Well, we don't. If we release it and we our circuit can't handle everybody yeah. jumping on the page, it would it would overload the system, and then people would be uh, very frustrated, obviously, because they can't get on. So we're testing the circuit right now, um, and then we're also going to test it within our own staff um, department heads will be asking staff to test mm -hmm. the different criteria of what they need to test, like request where a bus is or whatever. Right. Um, and once we go through that testing process, then we would look at releasing it to the public. And, and do we have an idea? How? I'm sorry. Can, uh, can Bill have, have it? Have for <laughs> yeah, he's um, going to test it out. Yeah, I'd sure love to. Um, um, but do we have an idea when that testing will be done or will it be completed? Um, we're looking at, okay, if we need a new circuit, it's going to take 30 to 60 days to, to have that in place. If we don't, then we can look at January. I just want to see a board member like Bill could get the app first to test it out. I would love to work with that. Yeah, I'd be happy to participate in your testing. Should you deem it appropriate. Thank you. Wayne, since we were scored down on this particular item, I was just going to suggest that in order to be more competitive with future grant applications, maybe we could run this particular section past the advisory committee on accessible transportation. ACAT, and maybe we could gather some ideas sure. from, from folks that have disabilities about how to make that better. Sure. Helen? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, now, uh, on these unit areas, anything else on ridership, update, grant? Grant? Um, yeah, I, I briefly uh, touched on this earlier, and there was some discussion on it. Um, from October 2015 to October 2016, we saw a decrease in uh, passengers per hour uh, to the tune of 7.3% down. Um, now keep in mind, and I, I mention this almost every board meeting, that accounts for the number of hours of service that we actually run. So that includes those days that we did not run service. We're, we're not saying that we had hours there. We're, we're assuming that we did not run those hours, which we didn't. Um, but the 7.3% decrease is mostly, from what we saw in our ridership, the two days before and after the evacuation, we saw a significant decrease in ridership productivity. Um, that's one factor that played into that um, significant decline. The other one is that October 2015, and pretty much every month in 2015 for that matter. Those were our best months that CAT has ever experienced in terms of ridership productivity. Um, so we're really comparing ourselves to the gold standard, which is good, I think we should be, um, but that's something to keep in mind, um, that if we were comparing it to October 2014, um, it would be a much less decline, probably in the 3% uh, range. So just something to consider. Um, also, I wanted to point out that um, on the other route, um, the 75 SSU Prowler, um, that the productivity there went down by 65%. Um, our planning staff continue to monitor all of these routes, um, and we will be recommending the uh, discontinuation of that service uh, next month. Um, and we've been working with SSU based on their calendar uh, when we can put that into place. So we've been coordinating with them but we will be bringing something to you next month. And also on some ridership, uh, you know, it was some in the news about it took a longer period of time for people coming back in town because there were a lot of things, you know, that the information did not get out because coming in the community, when do we get coming back? When does that, uh, uh, it, the setup of it that you had to be in by 10 uh, p.m. and all of that. So there were multiple things that uh, affected the ridership also because a lot of people didn't come back in town, uh, you know, as was mentioned. Okay, next sure. up, uh, yes. I have a question. Uh, and I might have asked this before and maybe I got a good answer that I just forgot. But uh, Grant, on the target numbers that you've got, the passengers per hour 18 or 19 for weekdays, 15 weekends, um, is, is it, I got this, 
I, I would think that that target, as an average for the system, may be fine, but but for individual routes, maybe not. Um, is it possible, or is it just not worth bothering to have a target that we'd expect on these different routes? I think that's a good idea, and I think that that's definitely something that we should consider doing. I, and we would need some direction from the board as to what those targets are. Um, I think ideally, um, we'd first have a split of do we want 80% of our routes to be driven up to ridership? Um, and how many do we want driven towards coverage, just uh, serving a more broad area? Um, once we get that split, then we can give certain routes a lower uh, target that the board has already decided that it's okay if those are lower. Um, but then on the other end, so long as we have you know the the split for ridership driven routes, then we can increase the the goal for you know the vast majority of these routes. But ultimately, this is going to be a board driven thing, and I'd be more than happy to. Uh, present some scenarios or that's come up before and we keep coming back to that the board mm -hmm. needs to give us direction about how we proceed on essentially this fundamental issue mm -hmm. and I'd like to do that and I'd like to do that <coughs> rather than later but I think for some of us for me I'll just speak for me I'm not sure how to give you that direction I, I know that we have to balance those two things uh, but the way you presented us the options going with the EV um, approach with those five different options, would it be possible for you to come back with some, some choices that might help us narrow that? I mean, right now you're asking, you know, for me to, you know, pick one star out of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, if you gave me five stars to pick from, that might make this something that would be more manageable. Is it, is it possible to, to get something more, it, for, the kind of op, for the kind of direction you're looking for from the board? Is it possible for you to give us some some sort of options like you did with the? Does that? Yeah. Seem yeah. Like I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah we can do it. Because I, I think you're right. I think we need to give you that direction. But I don't think, at least for me, I'm not sure how to give you that direction. Yeah, and, and I think it would work pretty well how we did the EV um, uh, analysis too. Kind of start more broad as to these are the implications that we're looking at. Because obviously, you know, when you're changing your routes, you're affecting, you know people's livelihood and, you know, their jobs and, and where they travel to and everything. So this is a very sensitive uh, process to go through. Uh, so I, I don't want to rush into it, but I, I'd like to give you all, uh, I guess, a presentation maybe next month about, you know, just overall, these are the, this is the balance that you're going to have to um, decide on and then maybe <coughs> the next meeting present some scenarios. I'd like to see that, and I think that that would also be nice to be having to have that being done now because I think when we <coughs> get to the ridership, right, right. this is going to help inform those decisions, and I'd rather have that now so that it's ready <coughs> to get to that point instead of getting to that point and then saying, well, we need to spend another two months figuring out our the directions that the, the board is going to give you. Yeah, so I think it also, and, and I think it also gives you all some information to staff you know, as to what our senses are in terms of when you start to reconfigure things and, mm -hmm. you know, where the priorities might lie. So, so do we need to take some action to ask for that or is that sufficient? We'll just you. Thank you. Okay, next is service delivery update, Curtis. Thank you, Chairman. Service delivery update is clear your packet and I'll address any questions. Any questions on the service delivery? All right, next uh, is the system deliver, uh, development update. Who on your staff is? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The system development update is in your packet, and we have staff here that can address any questions you may have. Any questions for the staff? All right, and the last is the financial update. Morning. Financial update is in your package. I'll be happy to answer any questions. The October results were as we expected. There were financial ramifications in revenue and also in expenditures from the hurricane. We lost approximately forty-two to fifty thousand in regular fares, about that much again in paratransit agency revenue, and our payroll cost associated with the evacuation were right at. $60,000 more, 
So it was $150,000 to $170,000 cost hit net, and, and that pretty much takes care of the month-to-date negative variance. And you'll see that same trend in the projection. Our projection is a straight calculation, and it's anticipating that the same thing will happen two more times, once every four months by the end of the year. When you take those adjustments out, instead of the $700,000 deficit, we're looking at more of a $250,000 to $300,000 projected deficit at your end, and staff is considering some revenue opportunities with the next round of federal funding that should help close that gap. Ellen? Thank you. Um, was there any SEMA, or FEMA money that would be coming our way due to the assistance with the evacuation? Sure. We, uh, we did a phone call with FEMA, and we had an interesting, uh, meeting with FEMA and their group, and, uh, they, we've been assigned a specific person to deal with just our, our agency, and, uh, we submitted a lot of documentation, spreadsheets, all kinds of stuff, pictures, um, the visually inspection, I mean, it, so there, it, that's in the process right now, how, how long it will take them to reach, give us. So we didn't have to have any standing agreement in place for any reimbursements? No, there, we did no agreement. We did, we qualified it, but we're in that process, and there's no, they, right. they don't give us a timetable. And what percentage of our out-of-pocket expenses could be absorbed by that? Um. There's an 80% split on eligible calls. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, FEMA folks define wages in overtime and regular, so we've got to work through how they're going to define our operator wages as the operators participated in, in the evacuation. And, um, of course, the fair revenue will not be eligible for reimbursement for the loss in fares, which is right at about 100000 But I do expect eventually to be reimbursed between eighty and and $100,000. It can take sometimes 12 to 18 months for this process from application to payment. So it might not get here for this fiscal year, but eventually we will get at least eighty and possibly as much as a hundred of that one fifty back. Thank you. Yeah, I am sitting in the same position on yeah. that, you know. Um, and, and for us it's eight million dollars. Yeah. The uh, <coughs> I would encourage you, I mean you're talking about trying to deal with that two hundred and fifty thousand shortfall with looking at some revenue sources. Yes, sir. I would encourage you to identify some cost cutting measures. Always, too, yes, sir. Because yes, that's sir. you know, it's nice to get the revenue but it's a lottery. Yes, and, and we, we analyze our financial results every month and, and continue to look for not only revenue enhancement but cost containment at the detailed account level. Okay, and along that line, um, in terms of the financial report we get with, with and I don't know if this is something you're going to get to further with this information, um, all, all of this very detailed information is good to have if I need to go through and look for something. But I wonder if it's possible to get a financial report for dummies, uh, uh, you know, as, as part of the presentation, just a single sheet that that just says, you know, this is our, I mean, over the next quarter, this is the, you know, the, the liabilities we anticipate, these are the revenues we anticipate, uh, just something simplified in terms of just, you know, chunks of money, aside from this, not, not to eliminate this kind of detailed analysis, but just right. something that's a very simple explanation of, you know, what bills we've got to be paying over the next three months, and, uh, you know, what our revenues are going to be, and any kind of explanation that might need to go with that in a very shorthand kind of... So, a three-month um, Just a kind of a three-month projection of, of, of revenue in, and expenditures out. out. Something like that. that. I just <coughs> something that, you know, from that, then if I feel like I really need to dig deeper into this, I could. But uh, just to have a snapshot of where we are. By category? Or just. just don't get too detailed. Okay. But, okay. I can do that for you. Thank you. Anything else, Terry? 
One, one more question, Terry, on the increase of the accident reserves. Yes, sir. Is that one accident, two accidents, three? What, the, what are these? The spike occurred in September, and um, we don't expect that to <coughs> reoccur. Um, we analyzed September's, and it was really a, a, a sum of several components. <coughs> we had a couple of accidents with multiple claims filed, and every time a claim is filed, our carrier <coughs> implements a $15,000 reserve. Some of those will roll as those claims are closed due to them not being valid. And we had a one-time settlement in an old workers' comp case, and there was a payout there, but also a medical reserve set going forward. So this number will, will be volatile, and it will go up and down at the end of every month. The true annual cost will only be determined at 630 because that's when the fiscal year is um, set in stone, so to speak, at that balance sheet date. And that's what we're required to um, um, to book as an expense. But it's always going to be volume of new claims at the actuarial determined reserve and any payouts that we make during the period that's going to drive that monthly cost. So going, going back to September, mm -hmm. since we've since forgotten this, Yes, sir. This was a fixed route bus, a paratransit bus. Do they have the accidents? That's I don't know which bus, and I can surely go back to the September report and pull those details and get that answer back to you. But there were several additional claims that were added in September, more than normal, and, and, and it just spiked that number. I would expect it to be between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars a month, and in September it was one hundred and fifty-one thousand. I, th I think on accidents, from a board standpoint, it's a fender bender and break a mirror. We don't really care too much, but if somebody gets hurt, I think we'd like to know. Right, but what if happens? We have an accident yes, sir. Sometimes we have a fender bender and, and people want to go to the hospital. Yeah, claim. Especially you know when we've got this kind of stuff going on, I think right. we'd like to know. So even. And I've included in like this the month we had a pair of transit. You told us one pair of transit. Yes, sir. But was that a serious <coughs> accident? We can, we, can, we can break down the detail more for sure. That's what the board wants to do. Yeah. Beyond the medical accident. Because we, we are somewhat liable for safety issues. Yes. So I think yes. We can know. categorize it and provide small yep. detail. Sure. Absolutely. And on those fender benders, Mr. French, if, if there were 15 passengers that filed a claim that month, our carrier would add fifteen, fifteen thousand dollar reserves, and I think that's why I expect some of that to roll off because most of them will not be valid, and they won't end up being a true cost to cap. Yeah, how is that determined? Does the insurance we, company make that yes. determination? Or? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you see in the board report is, is preventable accidents. Um, we don't, we don't show non-preventable, which is them hitting us. If that's we wind up with any liability from those? Well, financial. certainly people on our bus are going to claim against us. Mm -hmm. And then we have to walk through the insurance companies and go after the other driver and the whole process. But <coughs> initially, they're going to say, I got hurt on a cat bus. Now, uh, is the camera system, Curtis, uh, a set so that if uh, somebody's claiming they got hurt, that that camera system will uh, show that uh, that was not valid? Most of our buses have cameras, and uh, they typically work very well to see that, yes. And what we do is we get the video, when we take a portion of that video where the actual action happened, showing that specific passenger's claiming injury, and we send that to the insurance company, that video clip. And they look at it to see they look at it, and they take it from uh, there. And you could deny the claim, whatever they do, um, and go off to the other insurance company if there was a claim. So that it's, we send them the clip, we send them all the details of the accident, once we get it to them, then they start processing it for us. And then they go into it by looking at the results of the camera yes, sir. status and uh, whether that is legitimate or not. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else on financial? All right. Next is old business. Any old business? No, sir. Uh, new business. No, sir. Uh, new business. I wonder if we could uh, schedule a board workshop in early January. 
to go over our thinking, looking forward to the budget, setting our goals, setting things we want to uh, focus on. Sure. We can uh, start coordinating. Sometime in January. Yeah, yeah. we'll start coordinating dates and everybody's calendars. And no problem. Should we sure. sure. include the. Uh, uh, go ahead, Bill, and then go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Do it. If we're going to be talking about those priorities, should that include what Grant wants to put together for us in terms of this direction? Be a good time. I yeah. think so. And, and I would also. Wait a minute, Helen. I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Helen. Um, it would probably be more advantageous if we're going to, if the county's going to make their replacements on the board to wait until the new board members are coming on because I don't, I mean, they're going to be going forward. So I, I don't want to set up retreat or workshop until we know who the uh, new board members would be. That's a good point, Mr. Chairman. I was about to say the same thing because we certainly don't want to be redundant and going over the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to, um, just to mention to staff, what a great experience I had um, utilizing Cat the other evening. I, I took Kat, I took the, um, the shuttle from the airport um, and it was easily locatable and it was on time and it brought me right here to the transit center and then I took the 14 um, you know to uh, Abercorn in Washington and got off and went home and it was on time and, uh, and it, you know it was just a really really good service and it was nice to, to use both of them sort of in one fell swoop but I appreciate that. Okay and Curtis uh, a lot of times we see when particular subject comes up, people are still turning pages and all. So let's make sure I've made this comment uh, a while back that we have all of the pages numbered. So somebody can go to that section, uh, you know, if the, you designate what the particular thing is, it's not going to take an awful lot of time, but uh, they should be numbered so we don't have this constant turning by somebody is speaking. You know, Mr. Chairman, I'd also suggest that um, most, except for a couple of the documents that were included here, all the rest of the stuff is printed on one side. That, you know, we could probably save a fair amount of paper over a year's time if we just printed the stuff on both sides. Of the paper. Which brings us back to the ICAD proposal we had uh, a while back about replacing the book. We talked about it in our strategy meeting. Okay. For that matter, it wouldn't need to be an iPad. It could just be an electronic document. Most of us probably have our own devices that we could use for that. To bring it here would be easier if we had an right. iPad. I mean, if we've got to work from it in this room. <coughs> okay. Yes. For the, the document electronically is already available on the CAT website, right? That Q3M link? IQ. What is it? IQ. IQ. Well, let's make sure the suggestions are on the number. Okay. All right. Uh, now uh, we need a motion on the floor for executive session. It'll be personnel. Uh, what, what all is it? Um, personnel. Personnel yeah. matters. We've got uh, discussion, um, deliberation, et cetera. Employee personnel matters and lead matters of all my calls to the attorney client. Okay. So, yeah. We have a motion on the floor and a second to go in executive session. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. If everybody will uh, thank you for all attending and if you would leave except for the board members.
And then it's in here too. Yeah, three times. Now, and a lot of these different things that, that was that presentation? Yeah, yeah. I've never said anything. There's limited 